Hello and welcome. You found the Social Work Podcast. My name is Jonathan Singer, and I'll be your host as we explore all things social work. Hey there, podcast listeners. Jonathan here. Before we get into today's episode on adolescence, I want you to take a minute and think about your own adolescence. How old were you when you realized, I'm not a child anymore? How old were you when you thought of yourself as an adult for the first time? What's that thing you did as an adolescent, which at the time made no sense to the people around you, and once you stopped to think about it, maybe didn't make much sense to you either? A few years ago, one of my favorite podcasts, an Australian show called All in the Mind, had an episode called The Teenage Brain, Myth or Marvel. And this is All in the Mind. Natasha Mitchell with you on Radio National, abc.net.au slash rn. A warm welcome. You would have seen all the press coverage in recent years about the teenage brain, that it's a work in progress, that major structural changes are going on during adolescence. And that this explains why when we're teens, we're sometimes impulsive, risk-takers, emotional, explosive. You've got the picture. I loved this episode because Natasha Mitchell sounds so cool and because it addressed a fundamental question. Is adolescence real or is it just a social construction? And it got me wondering, have I been thinking about adolescence all wrong? Well, according to today's guest, Lawrence Steinberg, the answer is yes, we have been thinking about adolescence wrong. And he wrote a whole book called Age of Opportunity, Lessons from the New Science of Adolescence in Order to Change Our Minds. Dr. Steinberg is one of the most influential developmental psychologists of the 21st century. His bio is so long that if I read it all, there wouldn't be any time for the actual interview. So here are some highlights. He's the author of over 350 scholarly publications, including the classic textbook, Adolescence. Dr. Steinberg is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Psychological Association, and the Association for Psychological Sciences. Dr. Steinberg was the lead scientist in the preparation of the American Psychological Association's amicus briefs submitted to the U.S. Supreme Court in Roper v. Simmons, which abolished the juvenile death penalty. Graham v. Florida, which banned the use of life without parole for juveniles convicted of non-homicide crimes, and Miller v. Alabama, which prohibited the use of mandatory life without parole for all juvenile crimes. And on September 9, 2014, Eamon Dolan published his book, Age of Opportunity, which Martin Seligman, father of positive psychology, described as, quote, simply the best book I have ever read about adolescence, which is a pretty glowing recommendation. In today's interview, Dr. Steinberg and I spoke about the growing gap between the onset of puberty and the end of adolescence challenges facing parents, providers, and policymakers to ensure that adolescents have experiences and skills needed to be successful, and how reconceptualizing adolescence as an age of opportunity rather than an age of risk or simply surviving is an essential reframe in order to address the needs of youth in this developmental stage. We ended our interview with some implications for practitioners, educators, and policymakers. A quick note about the interview. Even though Dr. Steinberg and I work in adjacent buildings at Temple University, I interviewed him over Skype because he was out of state, and I really wanted to get this interview. If you want to learn more about Dr. Steinberg, please check out his website at lawrencesteinberg.com or follow him on Twitter at ldsteinberg. To connect with a global community of social work podcast listeners, please visit our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash swpodcast or follow us on Twitter at SOCWORK podcast. And if you liked what you heard today and are curious to learn more, consider buying his book, Age of Opportunity, online or at your local independent bookstore. And now, without further ado, On to episode 90 of the Social Work Podcast, 
Adolescence, The Age of Opportunity, an interview with Lawrence Steinberg. Larry, thanks so much for being here on the Social Work Podcast to talk to us about adolescence. Sure, I'm glad, glad to be here. In your new book, you propose an entirely new way of thinking about adolescence. So two related questions. First, how have we been thinking about adolescence? And second, how should we be thinking about adolescence? Well, I think that the you know the conventional view of adolescence is that it's a time of inherent difficulty, difficulty for kids, uh, difficulty for parents, difficulty for educators, and difficulty for other people who who work with uh, work with teenagers. Um, and I think that w- while certainly there are many many young people who have problems and many families that have problems during this time period. Um, that that's the wrong way to think about what adolescence is. And and what I, I try to argue is that we want to think about adolescence as a time of, of opportunity um, and not simply a, a time of trouble. Now, if we don't take advantage of that opportunity, it can become, a, you know, a period that's characterized by problems. But, um, uh, you know, the one way to think about it is is that a lot a lot of the messages that we send people, if you look at books written about adolescence for parents, um, is that this is a time when the best we can do is survive. Um, and I'm suggesting instead that um, maybe we should think about it as a time when people can thrive, and then ask, what does it take to help kids do this? Hmm, that's fascinating. Uh, And I'm going to ask you to elaborate on that in a minute. But before we get there, I'm curious, why are you suggesting that we should think differently about adolescence? Has the research changed? Yeah. So one of the most exciting breakthroughs in our understanding of of adolescence and this new understanding that I describe in the book comes from, from brain science. What I think we can tentatively conclude is that adolescence looks like a second period of heightened brain plasticity. Lots of people know that um, the brain can be affected by experience and that there are some developmental periods during which it's quite malleable. Um, And I think most people recognize that the early years, zero to three, constitute a period when the brain is especially uh, influenced by experience. What new research is telling us is that adolescence looks like a second period of heightened brain plasticity. And, and to me, what this means is that we really need to pay careful attention to the kinds of experiences that we provide young people, because the experiences that they have during adolescence may have a profound effect on how their brains develop and, and, and therefore a profound effect on the rest of their life. And I think you know, one of the things that people often say about adolescence is they don't realize how profoundly their lives could be changed by their decisions. In the introduction of your book, you told a little story of a teenage girl from a well-to-do family who was caught shoplifting. You suggested that asking her to explain why this happened was almost an exercise in futility. What's going on in the adolescent brain that would um, you know, be an argument against that kind of insight seeking. Those of us who have raised and worked with teenagers have recognized that lots of times kids just get carried away um, in the moment and they don't really understand why they do what they do. And I don't think that necessarily trying to get them to understand why they did what they did is is going to be particularly productive. Now, that that doesn't mean that, that talking about experiences that we wish they wouldn't have had isn't valuable. But I wouldn't approach it as a matter of insight. I I might approach it as kind of, well, when you're in this kind of situation, what could you do to stop X from from happening? As I describe some of our own research that we've done at Temple on adolescence, suggests that when, when teenagers are with their friends, this really activates certain brain regions that might make them do risky and reckless things that they wouldn't do by themselves. And that's how I connect this opening story with, with some of the work we've been doing on peer influences and the adolescent brain. So what are the implications of this changing brain, this plasticity, problems with self-control or, or rewards for pleasing peers that make adolescents do things that they wouldn't do? 
I'm, I'm thinking specifically about implications for social workers who work with youth in schools, you know, mental health settings, adjudicated youth, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I think that there are a couple of important implications here. The first implication, I think, has to do with what we mean by plasticity. So when the brain is, is very plastic, it's highly influenced by experience. And plasticity you know, sort of cuts both ways. Because when the brain is highly influenced by experience, that means that people can really benefit from positive experiences, as well as be harmed by negative ones. So that, that's what I mean when I, when I talk about an age of opportunity, um, that it's an opportunity to, to help kids develop in, in positive ways. Um, with respect to how we react to their bad behavior, and, and a lot of my research, as you know, is on juvenile offenders, um, uh, you know, I, I think we need to recognize that adolescents don't have the judgment that adults do, and that therefore policies that come down on them too hard may be disproportionate and, and unfair in, in some ways. I think that zero tolerance policies in schools make for a good example of, of that. Kids just go through a period where they do things that are more reflective of bad judgment than bad character. And I don't think that we necessarily should respond by treating kids who do bad things as if they're bad people, which I, th I think is a lot of what goes on you know, within the justice system. I'm very encouraged to hear you say that the adolescent brain is very open to positive experiences. Are there some experiences that social workers and other helping professionals could provide for adolescents or, or that they could help parents provide adolescents that are better for adolescent brain development than others? Well, I think that um, that it's useful to step back and say, what do we want to accomplish during this developmental period, and how can can individuals in helping professions and in education uh, and and parents, for that matter, um, uh, you know, move kids toward toward these toward this goal? And I and I and and to me, I think the most important task of adolescence the important developmental task is is improving self-regulation self-control whatever you want to call it um, so that kids are better able to take control of their emotions and and their thoughts and and their actions and what I think is encouraging is that there is a, a, a movement now um, mainly within education but I think it will spread probably to the helping professions as well. Um, there's a movement to help develop, you know, what people are calling non-cognitive skills. Uh, it's a terrible phrase, but that's the phrase that people are, are using. <laughs> and, and what they mean by that, really, I, I think has, has to do with self-regulation and self-control. And, and, and there are some things that seem to work. It turns out that there's, you know, a, a pretty good body of research now that suggests that mindfulness meditation um, helps uh, individuals develop better self-control, and 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 that's I think very good news because that's something that that counselors can teach kids how to do. It's something that teachers can teach kids how to do. It's something that parents and kids can both learn how to do um, because it's good for adults as well as for kids. So so it seems to me that helping to strengthen that muscle, if you want to think about it that way, um, ought to be a very important goal of of what those of us who work with kids try to accomplish. When I think of someone who can do mindfulness meditation, I think of someone who already has a certain amount of maturity and self-regulation. I, I, I don't I don't generally think of adolescence, but you're saying that they're very appropriate for adolescence. I think they're they're not only appropriate for adolescence, but I think that they're very teachable. Um, uh, you know, I, I think that we we have to, tweak the teaching in a way that's developmentally appropriate. So I wouldn't expect an adolescent that's not had any experience with mindfulness training to sort of jump right in and be able to do it for 10 minutes. I mean, it's hard for, for most of us to do it for that long. But I think you can start with, uh, with small steps and then increase the amount of time. And, and I've, seen, I've even seen some studies in which they've They've done this with adjudicated, you know, offenders and help them develop self-control as well. And th this is just one, you know, one one approach. 
Um, there are other things that turn out to be helpful, various types of cognitive behavioral uh, treatments that focus on self-control um, have been shown to be effective with um, aggressive kids, for example. But, but, but I think the general principle here is that acquiring the capacity to, to regulate one's th thoughts and emotions and behaviors is, is what we ought to strive to do. Um, when, when we're working with kids in, in need. Social workers address issues at the micro, meso, and macro level. And today we've been talking about a very micro perspective, adolescent neurobiology, self-regulation, things like that. Could you give us an example of one thing that, that policy, or, you know, macro level folks should understand about the new science of adolescence? One very important message that I try to drive home in the book is that adolescence itself as a developmental period is changing in ways um, that should make us rethink our, our policies and practices. And uh, among the most important of those changes is the sheer lengthening of it as a time of life. So conventionally, those of us who study adolescence think of it as beginning in biology and ending in culture. So, so adolescence begins with puberty, a biological event, um, and it concludes when people make the transition into the conventional roles of adulthood, so full-time employment, um, marriage, or, or something that looks like marriage, parenthood. Um, and what, what we see if we track those, those boundary markers is that the age of puberty is beginning lower and lower. And the age at which people transition into adult roles has been getting later and later. So this developmental period that not that long ago, I mean, let's go back just to the 1950s. You know, using those markers, adolescence probably took most people about seven years. And now it, it takes more than twice that amount of time. So we see kids who are going through puberty, you know, before 10 one statistic that may really astound your, your listeners is that data collected and in, in, published in the year 2000, so already kind of old data, um, suggests that, you know, 20% of the young black girls are developing breasts by the time they're seven years old. That's second grade. Uh, if we have policies on, on sex education, for example, that don't start, you know, we, we're, we're not going to start educating kids about sexuality until they're 14 or 15 years old, I mean, that's, that's seven years too late, uh, you know, for a large population of, of kids. And so we, we haven't adapted, uh, you know, the way that we treat and deal with adolescents to the fact that it begins so much later and takes so much longer. The important implication there is that what it means to succeed now um, as an adolescent, um, is the ability to sort of delay gratification for a very, very long time. So when there were jobs available for people who were fin just finishing high school, um, they could get on with their adult lives when they were 18 years old. Well, we know there those jobs are gone. One thing I was really surprised to learn in doing research for the book is that there is no longer any economic advantage of just going to college for a couple of years. You've got to get a college degree in order to reap the earnings benefits of that. Um, well, that's, you know, that means staying in school until you're at least 22. And the average undergraduate now takes six years to finish a bachelor's degree. So we're really talking 24 or something like that. Well, what... What do people need in order to be able to, to stick it out for that long? Not everybody loves school. And so how do, we, how do we help people navigate adolescence when it's such a long passage? And I don't think that we've thought very carefully about that. Mm. I think that's a really important idea that, that adolescence, at least in terms of an area of study, is a 15-year period. But I, I can't imagine that the policies interventions or services that one would develop for a 10-year-old would also be appropriate or practical for a 15-year-old or even someone in college. So in what sense is this period of adolescence one period as opposed to discrete segments? I, well, I, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a, 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 certainly a, a valid and good point. Um, 
I think of adolescence as as really comprising three different periods: the 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 early adolescent years, which go from puberty until probably, you know, the the beginning of high school, and then the high school period, and then this period of time that that goes until the the mid twenties. Um, there's been a lot of discussion in the academic world about what we ought to call that period, whether we call it, you know, young adulthood or emerging adulthood or extended adolescence. And, and, and frankly, I think that that conversation is a distraction because I don't think it matters what we call it. Um, I think what matters is that we recognize that it's taking people longer um, to move into the roles of adulthood. Now, back to the question about whether policies and practices for 10-year-olds should be the same as for 22-year-olds. So, of course not. Um, but I think we have to stop looking at 10- and 11-year-olds as if they're children um, and start thinking about what are their needs if, the, if actually if they're adolescents and, and, and not children. Um, and, uh, you know, just in terms of educating um, people in social work or in education or in psychology, um, I, I don't think that many people going into those fields w- would – um, automatically think of ten-year-olds as, as as adolescents, but but in lots of cases they are. And, and what does this mean for how we train people uh, in in our fields? And w- what kinds of knowledge do they need? I'll I'll never forget this experience I had doing an in-service education for middle school teachers um, in a in a very large urban school district. And I was going through teaching about adolescent development, psychological, emotional, cognitive development, and. I paused and asked if there were questions, and, 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 and a teacher raised her hand, and she said, isn't it true that during this time period when the brain is developing so rapidly that, that people are incapable of learning? And I was thinking, wow, this is just amazing that somebody who is an educator is viewing her students as being incapable of learning. Mm. Um, and, and, and so I, I just think we need to do a better job of educating people who work with young people about what adolescence is. Um, when it begins, when it ends, what the different phases of adolescence are. And I don't think in, in many instances we're doing a very good job of that. Is it a reasonable distinction to say that we're seeing a divergence between the biological period of puberty and the, mm, the social period that we're calling adolescence? I think it's a very reasonable distinction. But I, but, but I think that then I think it raises the question of, what does this disparity mean? What does this disjunction mean? So, so as a psychologist, I think about the fact that kids' engines are getting ignited at, at a much earlier age than their braking systems are becoming mature. And so what does it mean for, for young people to start to have sexual feelings and sexual urges you know, when, when they're clearly not emotionally ready to, you know, to develop those kinds of relationships and and what kinds of capacities and 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 skills do we need to impart to kids so that they can manage that and i don't mean just sexual urges i one one of the interesting things that we're learning from brain science has to do with the impact of pubertal hormones on the brain um and they they make us much more reward sensitive um not just sexually but in in response to all kinds of rewards Having to manage those urges and those drives at a, at a very young age is a challenge, and it's a different kind of challenge than I think most of us um, would ordinarily think about. And so, so one of the metaphors I use in the book is that there was a time when parents would say to their kids that they should wait until they were married before having sex with somebody. Well, that was easy to do when you went through puberty when you were 16 and you got married when you were 21. Um, <laughs> it's pretty hard to do when you go through puberty at 10 and you don't get married until you're 30. I mean, it seems completely unrealistic to ask somebody to rein in that urge for 20 years. That's what I mean when I say that adolescence is changing in ways that that's kind of outstripping our thinking about it and the policies and practices that we've developed. Another thing that's changed in the past 30 years is the emergence of video games. Now, you created a a driving video game in order to do research on adolescence and risk-taking. And I know you don't do research on video games, but I'm wondering if you have any opinions about video games and adolescence. You know, I I think we have a long history of confusing um, the the medium with with the message. And and so I think that a lot of the, the bashing of video games, you know, and Internet related activities that goes on now um, 
is is kind of silly. I mean, it's 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 like it's like asking whether television is good or bad for kids. Well, you know, it depends on whether you're watching PBS or Jersey Shore. Uh, <laughs> You know, and so asking whether kids' involvement in internet-based activities is good or bad for them, without asking what the activities are, uh, seems kind of just as, as silly. And and as you know, many of your listeners know, adults have been worrying about the media kids have been exposed to ever since there've been media. I mean, you can find diatribes against comic books, and you know, in the 1950s, and against comic books that would be very tame. By, by today's standards. So I think a lot of the concerns about kids' video-related you know, activities now are, are, are misplaced. A number of your previous books have addressed parents. Mm -hmm. Do you have any advice for social workers or really any professional that works with parents how they should help parents think differently about adolescents? Well, for starters, you know, I think it comes back to our earlier conversation about thriving versus surviving. If I said to your listeners, let's, you know, presumably most of them are, are social workers or in related fields, and said, look, I think you should be happy if your kid gets through adolescence without being a drug addict, getting arrested, or, um, or having an unintended pregnancy, and the, kind of that's the bar I'm going to set, you, you wouldn't accept that as... As, as your goal, you know, as a parent. So we want more than stopping kids from dropping out of school. We want them to, to actually enjoy learning and, and love being in school and want to continue on and finish secondary and go into post-secondary education, finish that too. So I think one, one change in orientation is to try to get parents to be more um, interested in what kinds of positive goals they have for their kids rather than simply kind of surviving it and preventing damage. The second implication, and one, I, you know, I think that's good news, is that a lot of the, the things that we've been doing all along and trying to help parents be better parents are probably good for, um, good for adolescents in ways that, that help them improve self-regulation. So there's a style of parenting that psychologists call authoritative parenting, which is the combination of warmth and firmness and uh, developmentally appropriate support for independence. And, and these things, when done together, have been shown to improve kids' self-regulation and self-control. And we know that there have been kind of experiments done where, where parents have been taught how to do these things. And so we know that we can, we can teach parents to be better parents. So I, I think those are two examples of things that I think social workers could do that, that would be helpful. One of the chapters of your book is called Winners and Losers in which you make the connection between adolescent development and income inequality. Can you talk about how the extension of adolescence you were mentioning earlier translates into a widening gap between winners and losers? I, I think that kids who grow up in, in more affluent circumstances um, are the ones who are the winners here. I mean, it's unfortunate and sort of an old story about the rich getting richer. Um, but I think that Given what we know about the impact of poverty and, and stress and trauma on the brain um, and how those experiences specifically disrupt the development of brain systems that are important for self-control, that the kids growing up in poverty are being disadvantaged in ways that are going to make it more difficult for them to delay gratification in, in the ways that are now more and more important for, for succeeding. So, um, so, so, so what's an example of that? If puberty is occurring earlier, that means that, that kids are, are going through this surge and reward seeking earlier, and they need a stronger prefrontal cortex than ever in order to deal with early puberty. And if some kids in, in our society are having experiences early in life that are interfering with the development of their prefrontal cortex, that they're going to be especially disadvantaged by going through puberty earlier. So that's w w one example of a way in which I think this change in adolescence is contributing to, to income inequality. So exposure to violent situations in neighborhoods, shootings or constant police intervention, the, the tearing apart of families as a result of the, uh, you know, the criminal industrial complex, as well as abuse and neglect. These are some of the things that impair the development of the prefrontal cortex that's, that's so important in impulse control and emotion regulation. 
And and that's so important in those ways, and that is even more important today because of the need to be able to stay in school so much longer. So I, I guess I would say that um, g- given the fact that we now need to complete college in order to be able to participate successfully in the labor force, that having good self-control and the capacity to delay gratification for a long time is more important than it's ever been. And so anybody that has experiences that interferes with that capacity is going to be more disadvantaged than, than ever before. So what can we do to help youth, particularly youth in these low-income and economically disadvantaged communities, do to develop impulse control and emotion regulation and, and become winners? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think one of the more, more, most important implications has to do with schools. And it has to do with asking um, what, what can schools do to help facilitate the development of these kind of non-cognitive skills. Um, and, um, you know, th- there's a lot of interest now um, around the country um, in schools for low-income uh, families, um, and not just focusing on the academic side of things. I mean, we can't lose sight of those goals, but that's not all that schools should be thinking about. And and asking, what can schools do to help facilitate the development of self-control and self-regulation and, and what some people are calling grit? Um, and I think that if you look at programs like KIPP, you know, that, that that's a big focus of KIPP is on character development and not just on academic skill development. You know, you, you, when you mentioned grit, I, of course, thought of Angela Duckworth's research on grit. Um, I, I heard her interviewed live at WHYY in Philadelphia by journalist Mike and Scott, who, who asked her why the concept of grit seemed to have taken off with the public imagination so well. And she said that in addition to it being an old and familiar term, which it is, um, it also represented something that was within our control to change, as opposed to IQ, which is this elusive thing that you're born with. So are you saying that educational programs that work on helping kids develop grit is one of the solutions to the problems associated with an elongated phase of adolescence? Yes. Angela Duckworth is a very um, close friend of mine and a collaborator. And we just finished actually an article on um, the development of self-control. Um, and so I've been very influenced by her thinking about this, and I, I agree. And, and I think that the research suggests that, uh, particularly during adolescence, that it is a lot easier to, um, to influence the development of grit than it is to influence the development of, of IQ, which, which tends to be very stable, uh, you know, after age six or so. But grit is not, uh, you know, grit's something that can be facilitated. And I think we ought, to, we ought to try to do that. Well, Larry, thank you so much for being on the podcast and sharing some of the insights from your new book, Age of Opportunity, Lessons from the New Science of Adolescence. Sure. Thanks a lot, Jonathan. <laughs> I'm Jonathan Singer, and thanks for being with me today for another episode of the Social Work Podcast. If you missed an episode or have suggestions for future episodes, please visit socialworkpodcast.com. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit our online store at cafepress.com slash swpodcast. To all the social workers out there, keep up the good work. We'll see you next time at the Social Work Podcast.